Right now, this is a live look over the Israel-Gaza border as we do get to the latest here on the situation. President Biden caught on a hot mic after his State of the Union address. He's heard criticizing Netanyahu, Israel's prime minister, saying the two need to have a come to Jesus talk. I do want to play that for you here, raw and unfiltered. All right, so we did add subtitles there so you get a look at exactly what was said because, again, that was a hot mic that we are talking about there. I do want to bring in Mark Chandler, Director of Government Relations at Coastal Carolina University and a professor of practice, also a former senior intelligence defense official to talk about that, but also all of the other developments here. Mark, as always, thank you so much for taking the time to join us here on a weekend morning. Uh, good morning, Josh. You're quite welcome. To, I'm glad to be here today. All right. So first off, I do want to get your thoughts here on that hot mic moment from President Biden. Some pretty strong words that come to Jesus talk with Netanyahu. What does that say to you about the situation here and the U.S. involvement and thoughts as the war is now in month six? Well, first off, I think it was a little bit of careless uh, action on Biden's part. However, I do think it starts to show the frustration that the Biden administration is having with Israel, uh, and in particular Netanyahu. Uh, actually, I think you're starting to see a fracture of any kind of personal relationship between Netanyahu and Biden or the senior officials in the Biden administration. You know, this follows a week in which the Biden administration is starting to look for inroads into other aspects of the Israeli government and Israeli leadership. They hosted uh, Benny Gantz, who is part of the War Council, but he's also part of the coalition that is one against Netanyahu. He's more of a conservative centric, if you will, in the Israeli government. They hosted him on an unofficial visit. In other words, he did not represent Israel official in an official capacity earlier in the week. So what I think you're starting to see is Biden's feeling a lot of public pressure, some international pressure, and, and starting to find ways that he can apply different elements of pressure on Netanyahu. The, the issue is, and I, and I think for the viewers, I think for Americans, uh, we need to understand that, that while there's a lot of frustration, yes, there's a lot of tragic casualties and deaths in this situation, uh, this is an existential threat to Israel. And, and Netanyahu has promised that he needs, that he will eliminate the Hamas military threat. So looking at that, I think a lack of appreciation for what the Israelis are facing and what Netanyahu is facing, you know, is a challenge. And so they're, they're going to the court of public opinion, if you will. I think that's what Biden's playing to, along with some frustration and lack of understanding of what Israel has to accomplish against Hamas. And I do want to show this video right here. This is from moments ago, as we did see another aid drop coming in from the U.S. there over Gaza. Now, we do know that there was a situation that unfolded just yesterday where the Hamas-run Palestinian Health Ministry does say that five people, including children, were killed when they were hit by falling aid after witnesses say that a parachute just didn't deploy the U.S. expressing its sympathy, but saying it was not one of the American uh, military aircrafts that dropped that aid. What are your thoughts overall on the situation? Does that show, I guess, some potential danger when you are airdropping aid? Well, actually, this is a dangerous operation, Josh. I mean, so in the military, we would do these operations all the time, but we're military, we're professional, we understand the dangers involved in such a, a operation. Now, even if the chutes had deployed, these packages are still hundreds of pounds and coming down fairly rapidly. So even getting under one with a chute deployed is dangerous. But in a military context and in an operation, we have what we call the drop zones secured. And so in doing that, we know that the, the dangers involved in this, we know how where the packages are likely to come down. It's not precision all the time. And so we're gonna secure that and make sure we don't have anyone injured or killed in, in that operation. Here, you don't have security on the ground. You don't have a way to cordon off 
these drop zones. And when we've seen the lack of uh, security that's there, we've seen the lack of any kind of or sense of order on the ground with these relief packages, th then I think you're going to see incidents like this. I'm actually, I mean, this is tragic, but I'm actually surprised we haven't seen more with, with what you see taking place on the ground with refugees and, and Palestinians trying to get to these packages. So I, I would expect more, regardless of who dropped this this package, you know, you're still going to see something like this without any coordination taking place on the ground. It's not just a simple drop supplies via parachute. And the U.S., of course, does want to bring in that aid by sea now because they did announce that they would build a pier. What can you tell me about that? Because the thoughts, uh, the plans, they are just developing at this point, and we know they were made public just a few days ago. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll be honest, Josh, this one caught me by surprise. Uh, this is not a simple military operation. So essentially what you're doing uh, is you're making an artificial pier or, or slash port, if you will, that's going to go out from the beach several hundred meters or, or several hundred yards out into the water. Now, in the military, we do this. We practice this all the time. It's something called joint logistics over the shore. And, and what we do is we, we build essentially a floating causeway. So if you can imagine just a, a bunch of equipment that's pieced together that goes out into the water several hundred yards. And so when we do that, we have to secure them uh, with other small vessels. And then that, that leads to a smaller set of vessels that are going to offload from the big ships. So it's a good way to move equipment. I mean, we move tanks this way. We move heavy supplies this way in military operations when there's not a port nearby that we need to use. But this is going to take uh, several weeks to do. So while it sounds good that we're going to do this, I wouldn't see us having this operational capability for, for at least four to eight weeks to do that because you have to deploy the personnel. It's going to take at least a thousand military people to try to put this together, including Navy, Marine Corps, and the best that do this are some army personnel. And they're stationed in Virginia. I know the Defense Department start to talk about one of the major units that can do this and deploy it. So when you get that, you have to establish the pier out into the water, but you have to have it anchored or secured to the beach. That's where I start to get concerned because I know the Defense Department has said no U.S. personnel are going to go ashore. Well, just as we've seen from the airdrop, if you don't have professionals on the ground at the at the kind of the anchor point, if you will, you're you're looking for trouble. So how they're going to secure that and establish that beach element without putting U.S. personnel ashore that concerns me because that, we're the professionals who do this. And the second phase, this has target written all over it. I mean, this is a U.S. operation. I'm, I'm sure we'll have some NATO or European allies support this. However, who's going to provide security ashore when those supplies get there? This operation, because the waves are constant, you have to maintain a constant balance of this pier, if you will. Who's going to provide that security? I think Hamas would, would see this as an opportunity to strike at America, if you will, by hitting some of the U.S. forces there, because this is going to be a long, drawn-out vulnerable operation. We've heard a lot over the past several weeks about this Rafa offensive, and it seems like over the past maybe week or so, there's less talk of it. Does it appear that that is still imminent and is going to happen? Well, I, I think it is imminent. I'm not sure if it's going to start because Netanyahu had stated before by Ramadan. Ramadan begins tomorrow. And and not, not to belabor the point, but Ramadan is the holiest month month in Islam. And so there's going to be a, a lot of activity and religious significance around Ramadan, and it's going to last for a month. And so as you look at that, obviously conducting a military operation during that time is going to be, a, a, you know, fraught with more danger than usual, if you will. And so you, you look at that aspect. I don't know if Israel is ready to conduct the operation militarily starting tomorrow. They are still fighting in Khan Yunus. They're still trying to, to weed out a lot of the Hamas terrorist cells that are located and, and dug in in Khan Yunus. I mean, they just announced as, uh, uncovering about 85% of the tunnel network up in that area. So when they're militarily ready, 
I think they're going to have to move in to Rafa area, whether that's tomorrow or whether it's it's set sometime during the next month. So it will be during Ramadan, but I think we're trying to tamp that down. Any military operation conducted during Ramadan is dangerous, but Ramadan is also a dangerous period for us. I mean, when we were in Iraq during uh, 2003, we were very concerned about attacks against us in Ram during Ramadan. And, but you still have to maintain a military pressure on your opponent. So militarily, I think they have to continue to go. I think they're trying to tamp that down with a lot of the public discussion and those ceasefire talks that they were trying to uh, to reach some sort of positive conclusion on. And let's talk about the ceasefire talks, the hostage release talks as well there, because we know that would be part of the same uh, situation and same deal. Now, the plan initially from Israel was to get that ceasefire hostage release deal in effect here for Ramadan. It appears that is not going to happen. Do we know what the latest on the talks are? Because it sounds as though Israel has accepted a plan. They've said they are open to it, but Hamas has said, no, not going to happen. No, I, that's that's it in a nutshell, Josh. I think everybody is talking now in Cairo except for Israel and Hamas. And and so what happened is Israel laid out a plan, which is essentially the same plan that they've been discussing for about the last six weeks. It's a it's a multi-phase plan beginning with a ceasefire process early on. Get more humanitarian aid in there. The key for Israel has been and was it this latest situ uh, discussion, they wanted the names of the hostages. They wanted confirmation. Now there's about 134 hostages still remaining. However, I believe Hamas released information earlier this week that 30, they confirmed 33 deaths. So you've got about 100 live hostages. Israel wanted that confirmed and they wanted the names of those hostages so that they could account for them. Hamas said no. Hamas said they don't have the ability to find the hostages or know where know who has which hostages. So the key thing is Hamas is holding those hostages and the release of the information. That's the ace card that Hamas has for this situation. And that's also Israel's weak point. So Hamas then walked out of the talks late in the week since Israel. So we're we're kind of at a stalemate, if you will. I think Israel's gone as far as it it can militarily, diplomatically, and domestically. Hamas is trying to get Israel to cave to a lot more, stop the fighting completely, and that allows Hamas to rebuild and regenerate, which is definitely what Israel doesn't want. So I, I think we're at a stalemate. Maybe they look at a shorter time frame of the first phase, but the, host, the hostages are key for Israel. We'll see how Hamas plays that. And let's head north and talk about the situation between Israel and Lebanon, specifically Hezbollah. That fighting continues as well there. What is the latest as far as that goes? Because it seems like that's not letting up anytime soon either. No, that, that's definitely not letting up, Josh. For about the last two weeks, Hezbollah has kept a significant amount of pressure on uh, northern Israel and Israel as a whole because, you know, Hezbollah has over 100,000 fighters. They've got 50,000 rockets and missiles that they can rain down on Israel. And so what I think you've seen, especially the last two weeks, in, in talking about how Hezbollah has maintained that pressure on Israel, they've, they've ratcheted it up uh, last week. And then throughout this week, they've stepped up that pressure or maintaining that pressure. You know, you, you had a guest on last week talking about the green light that Hezbollah was given. That's significant. And, and excellent guest, by the way. So you look at how that plays through the overall process. I think right now Hezbollah is pushing it right to that threshold that I talked about before, where they start to uh, receive significant Israeli counterstrikes. Now, Israel has kind of changed its tactics uh, over the last few weeks uh, to something that it hadn't done before, and they're being, being very preemptive in their strikes. They're going after key is, uh, Hezbollah planners and Hezbollah leadership, and they're even striking deeper into Lebanon to get them. So that's sending a notice to Hezbollah. So I think Hezbollah still has to weigh, do they want to risk opening up a full-scale war with Israel and all the damage that that's going to give 
versus continuing this very strong pressure uh, that they're going to continue attacking. I mean, the attacks are near daily, but they don't go about two days without attacking now. So this is significant pressure that Hezbollah continues to put. My last question here before I do let you go, the Houthi situation over in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, we do know here that there's been the first fatal attack that happened on a commercial vessel where at least three people were killed. Does it appear that the Houthis are going to be letting up anytime soon, or is the fighting there going to continue? Well, no, that's an excellent point you make, Josh. That, those were the first casualties that, uh, since the Houthis have been firing. You know, so that shows that they're going to continue that pressure. Yesterday, as a matter of fact, the Houthis launched a series of barrage uh, attack UAVs and missiles in the, in the Gulf of Aden, which is on the south side of Yemen and into the Red Sea that we've talked about through the Bab el-Mandeb and the Red Sea aspect. They launched at least 37 uh, attacks on U.S. military vessels and on commercial shipping. Now, CENTCOM responded. They attacked those, uh, shot down several of those, and then they had a counter-strike late yesterday to go against some of the cruise missile launch sites, if you will. So the Houthis have not been deterred in the least. Their supply, obviously, they are continuing to get a supp supplies from the Iranians. So as long as that continues, the Houthis are going to continue this. I mean, they're getting a lot of attention. They're definitely negatively impacting the world trade out there. But you had that ship that they hit a few weeks ago. It sank early in the week. The deaths this week, the Houthis before yesterday had had a consistent low level, if you will, four to five uh, missiles or UAVs attacking commercial shipping daily or every other day throughout the week. And then this barrage attack yesterday. So the Houthis, not deterred, going to continue these attacks un unless we actually go in there and destroy the Houthi command structure and the Houthi supply chain, in addition to interdicting what Iran continues to send them. Obviously, plenty of endless supply there. All right, Mark Chandler, always a great guest, always great for explanations on all of the developments here. Is there anything else you want to add about any of this before I let you go? Well, Josh, I, I think that's, you, you covered everything well today. I think you've got a lot of good points. You know, there's a, there's a lot that's going on in the court of public opinion. And, and we have to be able to separate the emotional aspects of something like this with the military requirements of an operation. The U.S. is starting to creep in there now. With this logistics operation, my concern is for the complicated nature of conducting that, we're now starting to put U.S. forces a little bit closer to the fighting out there. So we'll see what kind of target that represents. But re remember, this is going to be a long-term affair, and, and we just have to get to some sort of conclusion. I I'll say this. This would all stop tomorrow if Hamas would surrender. They, they started this operation they probably didn't realize Israel would try to take care of it once and for all the way it needs to be done. But this could all stop tomorrow if someone put the right kind of pressure on Hamas to stop the fighting. They, we would stop this. So we'll just have to see, you know, if this escalates any any more regionally in the in the coming days and weeks. All right, Mark Chandler, thank you again for taking the time to be here with us. We appreciate it as always. You're welcome, Josh. My pleasure. Have a great day. You too.